So uh, this this is my version of mass uh, vacuum cleaner. This cloud. So when 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 I when I try to think through a problem and I want to make sure I'm being maximally objective about it, and I'm not thinking from the first person point of view, but from a third person point of view, I think of a cloud. I say, well, it's it's a system, and it has at least one behavior. It has some other behaviors, but one behavior is dropping rain. You can ask, well, did it intend to drop that rain? Does it have agency? Uh, was was well? Do do clouds have antecedents to their decisions? Do they make decisions? Um, what, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is about how the brain makes certain kinds of decision, which is the decision about when to initiate a movement. And also, the, the, the related question of when does the brain make the decision? When is the decision? And part of that is being able to define what you mean by a decision, what you mean by an intention, uh, so I'll cover just a, a quick bit of vocabulary to start with. This is my own sort of vocabulary, but I don't think it's far from uh, what's, what's commonly used, right? An intention is a, is a tendency or a disposition towards performing a certain action in the near future. Um, it can, I think of it as something that's graded or continuous value. You can have more or less of this intention. Um, it's not necessarily conscious. Strike anything from your minds about consciousness. This is an intention. Maybe it's conscious, maybe it's not. That For now, that part doesn't matter. Just forget it. Um, and of course, many intentions never see the light of day. We're all familiar with that. Um, intention to lose weight, for example. Um, whereas a decision, and again, forget about consciousness here. This is just a neural decision. In the same way that the cloud decides to rain. Something does happen that causes the rain. Uh, we'll let that be the decision. So it's, it's the decision is the final commitment to initiate a, a given act, right? It's, it's this event that fixes the probability of the act roughly at one. Now, of course, I, th this decision could happen in my own brain, and uh, 200 milliseconds later, I could be struck by lightning and never actually perform the, the action, right? So it's not deterministic in the hardcore sense of physics and philosophy, but it's maybe you might say, from the point of the decision, it's ballistic. It's like I've thrown a stone. And then, uh, or I've tipped over the first in a row of dominoes. So if I, if I leave the dominoes alone, it will finish and reach, its, uh, reach the end, and whatever happens at the end of the chain of dominoes, maybe ringing a bell. Um, but I could, once I tip over the first domino, I could pull out one of the later dominoes and interrupt the process. So again, it's not deterministic. So the question... Uh, underlying all of this is how can we go about studying what I call the neurocausality of spontaneous voluntary action. Unlike mass, I, 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 I'm not avoiding so much this idea of causality, even though I've been told I should avoid it uh, by physicists, among others. I'm not avoiding it, thinking that the brain, uh, it, it, when, when you think about agency, for example, the brain is trying to make an inference about causality. Ca causality may not be real, but it must be something. Right? The brain is making an inference about something uh, because it's useful. So whatever that something is, I like to call it causality. Um, and what is the relation of this with the conscious perception of a decision or an urge to act that we have? Um, right? When is the neural decision to move relative to the onset of the movement itself? So what does all of this have to do with agency? which is what's supposed to be the topic today. I think that what I'm going to talk about is a, a little bit tangential to agency, but directly relevant. Um, so in a debate about the role that conscious decisions may or may not play in, in decision making, there's this implicit timeline with causes and effects. And what we're, the game is to sort of position the different players on the timeline. Of course, we assume that the cause is earlier than the effect, but where do we place the conscious bit, for example? Um, so we could focus our research on any one of those. The, the point here is that agency is a story about this set of actors, right? Uh, not a story in the case, in the sense of the all-American <laughs> story that we were talking about uh, earlier, right? Uh, not necessarily a false story. The, it's, it's the best and most accurate 
most valid story that the brain is capable of, of coming up with. Uh, so the brain is actually, in my opinion, trying to tell you something meaningful. Uh, when we talk about agency, at least. So I'm going to focus on what, what I've labeled here as the cause, what we could call the decision. The question being, when does this happen, and how does the brain make that decision? Um, I think everybody here is familiar with the readiness potential. Is anybody not familiar with the readiness potential? OK, this is a very readiness potential literate group. So everybody knows about Are you serious? Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this was discovered in 1965 by Kornhuber and Deka. And so uh, when you allow subjects to perform self-paced movements or to move kind of whenever they want to, uh, you see this slow buildup in scalp electrical potential preceding the onset of the movement by maybe one second or even more, depending on the subject. This is o over motor areas of the scalp. And so th this has been interpreted as the electrophysiological sign or signature of planning, preparation, and initiation of volitional acts. Right. Um, and more recently, so this has been confirmed by Freed and, and company at the single neuron level, so they recorded from uh, epilepsy patients who were being monitored with uh, implanted electrodes. Um, they find also a buildup in the firing rate of individual neurons in premotor and other areas. Uh, and it's been confirmed in primates and, and in rodents. So it seems to be uh, among mammals, at least, a universal uh, phenomenon. Um, about 20 years later, Libet, who I'm also sure you're, you're all familiar with, he knew about the readiness potential. He was interested in when the time of your conscious urge, where did it land on this timeline that's laid out by the readiness potential? So uh, using this paradigm that Patrick alluded to a number of times in his talk, subjects were using this uh, rapidly rotating clock dial, kind of mental chronometry. So when did you feel the urge to make that movement that you did? Uh, so you had subjects move kind of whenever they wanted to, spontaneously, without pre-planning. Once they had made the movement, they had to refer back to the clock and, and say, when, when, where was the dot on the clock when I was first aware of my urge to move? And of course, what Libet famously found was that the readiness potential starts far back in time, at least on neural time scale far back in time from the moment that we think, at least we, we estimate that we had <coughs> this urge to move. Um, so there's a lot of controversy surrounding this finding that's, that's been ongoing since, since the, the research was published. Um, I won't get into that. I, I just put that up there to sort of define what I call the prevailing view, which is that somewhere relatively far back in time, say when the readiness potential starts to deviate from some baseline, uh, there's a decision, and all the rest is an outcome of that decision. So maybe this point back in time here is where you tip over the first in a row of dominoes. And the rest is just, well, it's just a matter of time, right? Uh, somewhere at, at the end is when the movement actually happens, and relatively close in time to the movement is when you the self becomes conscious, quote unquote, of the, of the decision to move. Um, so what, what I want to walk you through now, using a thought experiment, is a different perspective on what the RP reflects, what this readiness potential represents. Um, so this is, this is just a thought experiment. I didn't actually do this experiment, although it, in principle it could be doable. Um, the idea is that you're interested in the etiology of the flu, and so you start with a, pop, uh, a random population of people, of volunteers at the beginning of flu season. Each one wears a, a little magical bracelet that kind of keeps track of their life points, of their health, uh, the state of their health at every moment in time throughout the flu season. So this is something like uh, your life points in a video game. So these go up when you're healthier. Maybe if you go to the gym and eat well, then for the next few days your life points are a little higher. Uh, and if you party a lot and don't get enough sleep, maybe your life points drift downward a little bit, and so on. It's that kind of a measure. Right? Um, and then if you get sick with the flu, you press a button on the little uh, uh, wrist device that you're wearing. That marks the time of the onset of the flu so that the researchers later on can look at the data, time lock to the onset of the flu, and see what happened beforehand. Okay. Um, so that's how this starts out. And this is, this is what some... Uh, typical traces look like. And this is a simulation that, that I actually wrote and ran in MATLAB. If anybody wants the flu simulator, they're welcome to it. Um, 
these are some sample traces from people who actually came down with the flu. Not everybody got the flu. Right? Um, and what, one thing you notice about this right away is that it's not a flat line. As, as I mentioned before, there are all sorts of reasons why your life points might drift a little bit up and a little bit down all the time. We might call this noise, right, relative to our signal, which is getting the flu. Um, is this a pointer? Um, so here, here, this, so this is not a, uh, a flat line, as I pointed out. It's drifting around. But when you do come down with the flu, then, of course, it drops precipitously. You're sick for a number of days, and then you recover. That's simple, right? Um, the other thing to notice is that this doesn't jump around erratically. It doesn't look like white noise. It's somewhat autocorrelated. Mm -hmm. So if, if it reaches a peak, the reason it reached that peak was that it had to kind of climb up. Right? It didn't just jump up. Um, so, these are traces from, from some of our volunteers who, again, they pressed the button when they got the flu, so we know when the onset of the flu was and we can look at what's happening. So, what happens if we do, just as we do in a typical EEG experiment, we time lock to these events and we align all of our data to, to this flu onset and look and see what happened before. Well, this is what the simulation tells us. So, before you come down with the flu, going back one, two, three days, uh, your life points are going down uh, and down and down uh, until the point that you actually come down with the flu and onset of symptoms and of course things get really worse much much quicker from there. Right? So this all makes sense so far. Until, yeah? So what was the life points again? That was a composite of? Of, uh, let's say it's just some hypothetical measure of your health. How, how, how good is your health at that moment? Maybe a combination of various biomarkers. It's a thought experiment, so we can do whatever we want. Um, so, with that in mind, it, it being a thought experiment, we actually know everything. And, and we know now that this is when, when the person came in contact with the virus, or when people came in contact with the virus. So now when we see this, this is worrisome now, because this doesn't make any sense, right? We would have thought, we would have assumed previously that contact with the virus might have happened back here, right? And we plant the line here, say, wait a minute, how could that be? That would, that would mean that the person knew the future, knew they were going to come in contact with the virus, and, and their, immune system, their immune system or their body decided, you know, I might as well start getting sick now. <laughs> Just get it over with and, and get the ball rolling in advance, right? But we know that people don't know the future, and we, we doubt that immune systems do anything of that sort. So, so something's wrong here. Something's wrong with the inference we've made from this downward uh, sloping line, right? Um, and what's wrong with it, what we haven't taken into account, is that uh, you don't get the flu from coming in contact with the virus, right? You get the flu from coming in contact with the virus at a moment when you're susceptible to it, right? When you're more susceptible. You have an immune system. So here's one of our players, and you know, comes in contact with the virus at all these different times, but doesn't come down with the virus. But here, it just so happened that these two events coincided, so their, their life points were on their way down, just by chance, and at that moment they contracted the virus, and boom, that was all, that was all she wrote. Then they came down with the virus. So, so the, the point here is that you tend to contract the virus when your life points are already on their way down, not because you were getting ready to get sick, Right, um, that was that was the error in our in our reasoning here, and so I I, I say that this is a this is a, a phenomenon of intrinsic fluctuations. They get caught in the flash photo of event locked averaging. So you have these intrinsic fluctuations. They contribute. They don't cause the event in in, in, in any sort of a sense. They contribute to it coming about. Uh, but when you look at it in the average. You make this, you get this erroneous impression of causality, and of intentionality, of something being done for a purpose. Um, so this idea, in fact, is not entirely new. I scoured the literature after I started. So this was the beginning of, of some research that I did, and I'll talk about the research in a moment. Um, but I scoured the literature. I thought somebody must have thought of this before. And in fact, uh, Eccles, uh, and this would be Sir. Sir John Eccles, 
in his collaboration with the philosopher Karl Popper, uh, entertained this idea that there is a tendency for the initiation, I'm just going to read this, for the initiation of the movements to occur during the excitatory phases of the random spontaneous activity. The earlier phase of the RP, up to about 200 milliseconds before the movement, would then reflect this spontaneous activity of which the immaterial mental event then takes advantage in order to produce the voluntary action. So really in here, all he got wrong here was, was the immaterial. You don't need that. You don't need that actually to make this work. And, and so I'll show you evidence of that. Um, and, and according to Gomez, here Gomez who was writing about their work, this hypothesis implies that spontaneous fluctuations such as those reflected in the earlier part of the RP should regularly occur independently of any intention or movement so as to allow the production of voluntary acts. Right? So, so this is very close to uh, the idea that I'm going to talk about. So do we have intrinsic or spontaneous fluctuations in neural activity? Absolutely. We have them at every spatial scale, right? From the probability of synaptic vesicle release all the way up to the residuals in your reaction time on a behavioral task. Every spatial scale. Um, this is what uh, fluctuations in neural activity look like, whether you're measuring uh, EEG or some other physiological variable. Um, they don't look like this. Check your equipment if you're getting this kind of s s uh, <laughs> signal from your, check your subject, they might be dead. Right, you get this kind of signal. You do, it is noise. This is noise, right? But it's what's called autocorrelated noise. It means that the bigger drift is, is slower, right? Or you could say the slower drift is big. Same thing. And the faster, uh, the, the faster fluctuations are smaller in amplitude. So you basically, if you're looking at in, in the, uh, the frequency domain, you have uh, diminishing power as you go higher and higher in frequency. This is called 1 over F. Uh, well, we call it 1 over F noise. I try to avoid the word noise, but for lack of a better term, I'll use the word noise. Um, so this started with me posing this question to myself. How, supposing I had to build a machine. So I went back to this exercise with the cloud of trying to be as objective as I could about it. I didn't think about myself producing movements. I said, what if I was an engineer and I had to produce a robotic arm that could do with its task? A robotic arm like this, and the arm would just make a movement, some predefined movement, maybe this one, at random times, spontaneously. Right? And one easy way to do that, the simplest way I could think of, was to take advantage of the internal noise in the system. So no matter how much I pay for my equipment, there'll be some noise at some level. I can, I can boost that noise up closer to the threshold of the actuator and just wait. Right? And sooner or later, the noise, even if I impose a, a slight slope on this noise so that I'm kind of approaching the threshold gradually, at some point it will cross the threshold just by chance. Right? Um, and Supposedly, if I time lock to all those threshold crossings, I might recover something that looks strangely like the readiness potential. You'll see that in a moment. Um, so, one way to think about this kind of uh, background noise in the brain is in the context of a uh, accumulator, a neural accumulator. Um, this is a this is a, a kind of model that's been used for decades in decision making research. Um, and we thought, well, maybe we can use this same kind of model uh, in, in our research on spontaneous initiation of movement. So here's an example of what an a, 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 a accumulator looks like um, in a perceptual experiment. So at a given time, you, 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 have, you have noise, and you have some noisy evidence that appears on the screen. Here's, here's the evidence. And when the ev evidence appears, of course, this, uh, this line uh, bumps up a little notch. Right? That's the appearance of your evidence. And some not neuron or population of neurons, which we think of as a decision variable, is, oops, um, is integrating over this. And you can see the integral in red. Right? And so the, and this is integrated up until the decision threshold. And at that moment when it crosses the threshold is when you or the monkey or the animal in the experiment reaches to press a button and say, aha, I, I saw it, or give a response, say it was tilted to the right instead of to the left. 
Um, so we thought we could use this same kind of model in the context of making spontaneous decisions uh, rather than stimulus-driven decisions, uh, except that now we're in a regime where we're very, very close to the noise threshold. We're barely above the noise floor. Um, and this is what some typical traces would look like from this kind of model. They look very, very noisy. They don't look, uh, they don't look like what this looked like at the very end. Uh, you have this very steep linear climb. You can still see that it's a bit noisy. It was a bit noisy. Sorry, I couldn't get it to stay on the screen. But here, things, look, things are very different uh, when you're buried inside the noise. So it's the very same kind of model, but it has a very different kind of behavior because we're close to the noise. So we started with these two assertions. The brain uses the same machinery for decision-making in Libet's task as it would in any decision-making task. Accumulation of evidence to a threshold. Except that in this case, there is no evidence per se. There's mostly internal noise plus this weak imperative to move. Um, and I'll get to in a moment what this what this is about. And the second assertion is that when the imperative to produce a movement is weak, which is this shallow uh, line here, the precise moment at which the de decision threshold is crossed is largely determined by spontaneous sub-threshold fluctuations in neuronal activity. So with this very shallow slope uh, relative to the amplitude of the noise, you can imagine, had the noise been different, well, this might have crossed the threshold at this moment in time, for example, or it might have crossed the threshold somewhat later. The fact that it crossed the, thre the threshold at precisely this moment and not some other moment was due to the noise, right? The background noise. Um, this weak imperative to move comes from the demand characteristics of the task. So in Libet's task, you're expected to produce a movement. Even though I tell my subjects, or Libet would tell his subjects, you can make the movement whenever you want to. In that experiment, people rarely wait longer than 15 or 20 seconds to make their movement without you telling them anything. You've given them permission to not move at all, ever. Right? Uh, but because, of the, because they know that they're there in this experiment in order to make movements, they make them after a while. So there is this subtle, let's call it an imperative to produce a movement at some point in time. And that's why when we model this, this, has, this isn't perfectly flat. Right? There's a little bit of a nudge. Um, so, we call this the, the, the stochastic decision model. It's actually a, a, a very standard sort of model. It's called a leaky stochastic accumulator model. So, you have this variable, which is drift, or this imperative to move that I talked about, which takes on a relatively small value. You have leak here, um, which makes this nonlinear and uh, makes it more biologically plausible. Um, and you have noise, and a threshold on x. So these are the only three uh, free parameters. So this is what it looks like when you run the model many, many times. Uh, on average, on mean, it climbs up a bit uh, to reach a steady point, uh, to reach a, a steady level where the distribution uh, 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 becomes stationary, uh, and then just sort of varies randomly about that point indefinitely. right? Um, we impose a threshold and look, look at the crossing times of the threshold, right? and we map those onto the waiting times. How long did the subject wait before they spontaneously made their movement, which is for them to choose. Yes? I'm sorry, and how, how would you uh, express the, the, uh, the y-axis here? Ah, the y-axis the y is x. Right? Okay, and the interpretation is? Is that this is, uh, this is your the x is your decision variable, and up is the, toward the decision to, okay, move now. So when you cross this, when, when the system crosses this threshold, then a movement is issued. And so the distribution of these crossing times would give you the distribution of waiting times, how long you waited before you produced the movement. Um, and the average of all of these traces, when they are aligned to the time of threshold crossing, uh, gives you the, the anal analogy to the readiness potential itself. So this is the, the, the shape of the rise towards the threshold. 
And so when you, when, you, when you time lock these to the threshold crossing and we reverse the sign just to make it look like the readiness potential, which is a negative going voltage, it does look remarkably like the readiness potential. Um, to test this, we took, uh, we, we searched for the parameters that gave us the, bet, the best fit to this waiting time distribution here, and, and we managed to get quite a good fit. And then using those same parameters, we asked, well, what does the shape of the uh, output of the model look like aligned to uh, the threshold crossing? And remarkably, that lined up very, very well with the shape of the readiness potential from our subjects. So this is from a cohort of subjects who performed Libet's task, and we recorded EEG in the classical way. Um, we did Libet's task exactly as he had done it. Um, and we presume that this doesn't line up with, uh, this doesn't terminate at zero, but it terminates somewhere before zero, which is this hypothetical moment that I talked about earlier, the decision to move. So based on some other evidence that I won't get into now, we had reason to suspect uh, that this decision happens at about 150 milliseconds before zero. Um, one good reason for that comes from Libet himself, because he asked his subjects, uh, when did you feel that you had made the decision to move? And that the average was about 200 milliseconds before zero. In our experiment, it was about 150. Um, so one mistake that Libet made, might have made was to not take his subject seriously. When they said they decided something at T minus 200 milliseconds, maybe they meant it. Maybe their brain was trying to estimate something meaningful. Right? So we went on to try and come up with uh, a prediction that we could make with our model, a novel prediction that we could test. And so we did this using a variant of the, of the paradigm that we called libidus interrupted. Um, so after doing the classic Libet task for about 20 minutes, we, we tell the subjects, we'd like you to repeat the same task again, monitoring the clock dial, doing a, a random movement whenever, whenever you want, at a time of your choosing. Um, but occasionally, randomly, you'll hear a little <coughs> click. Just a click. Um, and if you do hear the click, then you should perform the movement, which in that case was pressing a little button. Perform the movement immediately, as quickly as you can. And then we'll just go on to the next trial. Um, and there's no preference either way for being, for being interrupted by the click or making the movement yourself. Whatever happens first, happens first. Um, and so the, each trial ends when either the subject makes a spontaneous button press, as usual, or if the click is heard, then the subject makes the, uh, the, the movement immediately. So a prediction, then, from the model using this paradigm goes like this. Um, this is our decision variable. Here's the threshold. And okay, I've, I've labeled this as negative uh, going up just to be consistent with the readiness potential again. Um, if the subject happens to be interrupted with the click here at this point in time, then the reaction time is, is given by the difference between this point in time and the moment at which a very rapidly rising, uh, a very rapid rise in the decision variable reaches the threshold. So your reaction time will look like this. On the other hand, if we happen to interrupt the subject here, well, the background activity is already that much closer to the threshold. So they have a shorter distance in, in x to traverse. So the reaction time will be that much shorter. Right? So what we predicted was that fast reaction times to interruptions should be preceded by a buildup in negative signal amplitude beginning well before the interruption itself, even when the subject wasn't preparing to move at that particular moment. And to make a long story short, that's what we found. Um, if you look at the data here, this is the data time lock to the movement. This is the data time lock to the click. And you can just focus on this. Um, so you can see that the, the faster third of the movements had a steeper slope, steeper negative slope than the slower third of the movements. When I say movements, I mean responses to the interruption, the interrupting click. Uh, looks very much like what the model predicted. Yeah? Do you, does that, do you make any prediction about what would happen if you weren't thinking of making a voluntary movement? Um, no, I think it could go either way. Right. I, I've thought about that quite a bit, but I, I can't think of a good reason for it 
to go one way or the other. So it's just about how close you were to the voluntary movement that you were presumably planning on making when the click is mm -hmm. heard. That's, right. that's what you want, that's what you predict. Yeah. Right, but so no, the point here is that this, this was, we, so we thought of the possibility that we might interrupt people just when they were, just when they happened to be planning to make a movement anyway. Yeah. And maybe that would explain this, right? Yeah. Well, we told, we thought about that in advance. We told subjects, if ever you get interrupted when you just happen to be in the process of getting ready to move, call out the word uh, 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 coincidence. Right. And so subjects did this rarely but reliably. And then we excluded those trials. Um, there are a couple of other possible confounds. One is that maybe, maybe these faster responses just happened to occur when the subject had been waiting for a longer time, period. They had just been waiting longer, and so everything had been building up more. Uh, but the distribution of their waiting times was the same for the slow, fast, medium. Uh, they were identical. Um, so it looks like subjects were not getting ready to move at this, at this particular moment. This, this we sort of caught, we used this technique to catch those background fluctuations in the act, right, of, of, of biasing the precise time of your movement. In this case, we showed that they were effective in, in making you a little bit faster to move and uh, can reinforce that by showing that the model makes a very similar looking prediction. Um, what you'll notice is that this doesn't look like a readiness potential. It's very, very linear and shallow. Uh, and that this is what the model predicts, something very linear and shallow. Um, so this is our not so prevailing view, um, at least not yet. Maybe it's becoming more and more interesting people. Um, what's happening well in advance here of the movement are, are, is, is characterized by spontaneous fluctuations in neural activity. Uh, that biases the precise moment of the threshold crossing. And the subjective urge here actually coincides with the real neural decision to move, which we suggest is a threshold crossing event that happens at around 150 milliseconds per movement. So one simple summary of our, of our view uh, is to say that it's, it's Darwinian, whereas the classical view is more Lamarckian. So we look... In the classical view, we see this thing building up, and we see purpose there. We see that, we see, oh, something's trying to do something, right? The giraffe throughout evolution was trying to reach the higher leaves on the tree, and that made the necks of successive generations longer and longer, rather than the uh, Darwinian view that simply the ones that happened to have longer necks got, got the leaves. Um, was that too opaque? <laughs> okay, um, so since we published uh, those results, there's been uh, some rather important support for the model. One comes from this recent study by Murakami et al. Uh, with, with rats, of all things. Um, so in this experiment, the rat has to wait in this little waiting port with his nose there. He waits for a tone. Uh, and then after the first tone, he continues waiting and has to wait a variable amount of time for a second tone. And when he hears the second tone, then he's free to move into this reward port and get a large reward. Juice, I think. Um, but sometimes the rat got impatient and left the uh, waiting port early. This is called an impatient trial. And when he did that, he still gets a small reward. So he's still rewarded, but not as much. So there's, there's, an, there's certainly an incentive for the rat to wait the whole, uh, the whole period of time, but sometimes maybe he gets tired of waiting. Um, so they focused on these impatient trials, which you can argue count as uh, a spontaneous act, a spontaneous movement on the part of the rat. Um, and what they found here, they were recording from M2, which is uh, uh, an analogous to secondary motor cortex. Uh, premotor cortex. They found were these uh, slow rise, gradual rise, nonlinear in, in uh, firing rates uh, that reached a certain threshold just before the uh, rat left the, the, the waiting station on an inpatient trial. So they, and they look remarkably, remarkably like the readiness potential in their shape. 
And they were able to model this using the very same kind of model that we used, a leaky stochastic attenuator. Um, they also found a second population of cells that were interspersed with, with, with these cells here. And I don't have a plot for those, but what those cells behaved like, whereas these cells behaved like the outputs of an accumulator process, this other population of cells they found behaved like the inputs. They exhibited a noisy but steady firing rate that correlated with how long the rat spent waiting before he left uh, the waiting station. So they were able, with their higher spatial precision than I could ever dream of with EEG, to, to tell apart two different, these two different populations, one playing the role of the input to an accumulator and the other playing the role of the output of the accumulator. Um, and they, they, sum, they sum up their finding in a very good way. I don't think I could have uh, said it better myself. Bounded integration models identify the initial intention to act as the moment of threshold crossing while explaining how antecedent subthreshold neural activity can influence an action without implying a decision. Um, the only really place where I disagree with them here is the use of the word intention here. They probably should use this as decision um, as well. Did you have a question? No, okay. Um, some more support uh, for the stochastic decision model. This is very recent study. Has anyone seen this study yet that just came out in PNAS uh, in the last couple weeks? Okay, anybody else? So, so uh, uh, this comes from the lab of my friend and colleague, John Dylan Haynes. Um, so they, they hooked their subjects up to a, a, a brain-computer interface, which is nothing more than an EEG cap uh, that's plugged into a computer running a machine learning classifier. Um, and the goal of the computer was to try and predict or detect in advance when the subject was about to press a, a foot pedal. This was a, done with the foot. So they, they had to move their foot a few centimeters and press on a pedal. Um, and the subjects in game, engaged in a game with the brain-computer interface. The idea for the subject was to press the foot pedal while the, light, while the green light was on, which means press the foot pedal without being predicted by the computer. If the computer predicted that you were about to move, the light turned to red. And if you still went ahead and pressed the button, even though the light had turned red, that was a success on, the, on, the, on your opponent. Uh, that was a success for the computer. <coughs> the computer tried to predict you. You try to avoid being predicted. Um, and here they measured not only this stands for the EMG. They measured uh, muscle activity in the calf muscle just before the movement. Uh, and then they also measured the time of the actual depression of the, of the button. Um, without going into too much detail, if, I encourage you to read the paper. It is a, nice, it is a very nice result. Um, what they found was that they could, account for, uh, they could account for everything back until about 200 milliseconds before the movement um, from among the predicted and the, abort and the aborted button presses, times when the, the computer suc uh, successfully predicted that the subject would press, and the times when the subject successfully aborted, up until about 200 milliseconds before the movement. Um, but if it happened before that time, if the interruption were to have happened before that time, uh, the subjects would have been able to abort it. Um, so it, it looks as if, did, did that make sense? Um, I think what I missed to say was they, they, they also had this condition of where they, where they made silent predictions. So the computer tried to make its prediction but didn't show them the interruption. So they could see the difference between the real interruptions and the silent ones. So if you look at the distribution of the silent uh, interruptions, it continues way back in time before 200 milliseconds. These two... Uh, the, these other conditions combined only explain the data back to about 200 milliseconds, meaning that if the interruption had happened before that, the subject would have been able to have withhold held their moment, withheld the uh, movement at that moment. Um, so they, they declare that this, this point in time of about 200 milliseconds prior is like a point of no return. Um, and we predicted that to be about 150 milliseconds before movement, so we weren't off by about how much. Um, 
can you, um, it, I, I do know that paper, I hadn't mm -hmm. recognized the name of the first author, it's very elegant and very beautiful. Um, it is a game, so presumably if the computer gives me a red light and I still respond, then I get in some sense punished or the computer gets rewarded. You lose points, yeah. Yeah. So, um, game theory is everywhere, so it must be true. So presumably the, the, the clever subject will try to change the way their brain works so as to disguise their intentions or something. Something like um, that, yeah. Is there any, anything either in the paper or do you have any comment on the, the possible sort of adaptive nature of that situation? I, mean that, I don't think there was anything about that in the paper. No. Um, but theoretically, that should be impossible. It should be impossible for you to willfully change the shape of your readiness potential, at least on such a short time scale. Um, maybe with years of meditation. Um, or, or, it depends a bit uh, on your model of what the readiness potential is, but I, I see certainly within a stochastic model it should be impossible. Or if the readiness potential is what it, it, you yeah. think it is, it should be impossible. It should be impossible. Yeah, because it's just noise. That's right. That's right. Uh, it's, it's conceivable that you might have two different roads to movement. One of them, the usual one, and another one uh, where you ignore the evidence and just force a movement to happen, uh, independent of the evidence. That could explain right, uh, as well, but... Yeah. Thank you. What's the age group of these subjects? Uh, these were students in their 20s. Because it was done in Berlin, and everybody in Berlin seems to take about 20 years to get any kind of degree, so they were probably in their 30s. <laughs> oh, maybe they were in their 30s, yeah. No, I seem to remember the mean age was somewhere around 25. Or, um, yeah. So what about... Now, okay, so now you're allowed to think about consciousness. Uh, so what about Libet's W time? So Libet called the time, the time at which you... Uh, uh, estimated that you had felt the urge to move, and we call that W time for the will, right? The subjective urge to move. Can we get any purchase on that using this same kind of model? Well, just to unpack the situation and make very, very clear what happens in this experiment. I think everybody probably already has this picture, but just in case. If you look at this timeline, right, uh, this ticks along until the moment at which you make a movement, Right? And so far we still don't know anything. Then one or two seconds elapse, at least, and then the subject has to answer this question silently to themselves. Where was, right, retrospectively, where was the dot on the clock back when I was first aware of, of the urge to move? Right? So this is a retrospective judgment. Is W here a subjective event? Nobody knows. We don't know if anything actually happened anything special happened at this time, right? Mm -hmm. I suppose that this was the time when the brain actually decided, in, in the way I've defined earlier, decided to initiate the movement. But that doesn't mean that any conscious event happened at this time. All we know is that one or two seconds later, the subjects estimate that they had had an urge to feel back then. Did they actually have it at that time or not? It's hard to say on such a, uh, so on such a uh, small uh, time scale. The facts, and this is sort of a tongue twister, is that W is a subjective estimate offered after the fact of the time of the subjective urge to move. Period. That's precisely what W is. It's kind of a mouthful, but that's what it is. Um, my best guess is that W is informed by neural events that happen around T0, a little bit before, a little bit after. Right? If the brain is trying to make this post hoc uh, estimation, why not use whatever information is available to help make it? The, so whatever kinds of predictions are made by a, for, uh, by a forward model, for example, and whether or not those predictions are in fact confirmed. Um, so we, t we took our model uh, and just added a second slightly lower threshold. And we call this the prediction threshold, whereas the original threshold is the commitment threshold. So we imagine that some some population of neurons is monitoring the neurons that actually uh, uh, excite the movement, that actually trigger the movement, um, and that it's at, at some level of this output uh, decision variable, uh, right about here, um, 
the brain makes a note, says, well, if I've reached this level, then I'm very likely to make a movement in the very near future. Um, brain, in a sense, making a prediction about what's about to happen. So if you, if you take this dual threshold model, um, one prediction that comes from it, and you, sorry, um, W time then becomes the temporal offset between these two threshold crossings, right? Or between this threshold crossing and the onset of the movement itself. Either way, you get the same prediction. So this gives us our W time, the difference in the crossing time between the two thresholds. Uh, sorry to get into details, but the gap between the commitment threshold and the prediction threshold is assumed to be constant. Roughly. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. And, and your, your sort of psychological commitment is that people have some experience associated with crossing the prediction threshold, but they might not have any experience associated with crossing the commitment threshold. You don't I'm need to sure. know about your commitment threshold. Right, you don't need to know about it necessarily, because you, you, could, you could just take the, the, the difference between this threshold crossing and yeah. the onset of the movement itself, and that would work just as well. Yeah. So I'm not making any commitment about that as yet. <laughs> So one prediction that follows from this is that if you spend a relatively short time waiting before you make your movement, according to the model, that means that the, the rise of the decision variable was relatively steep, right? Which means that the crossing time between the, the, the difference of, between these two crossing times is going to be relatively short. Whereas if you waited a long time, that means that the uh, uh, trajectory of the decision variable was relatively shallow. Uh, and so the difference here is going to be longer, right? W, w time will be uh, earlier, right? Will be farther back in time from the onset of movement. So this is what the this is what the model predicts. This is some large number of trials, of course, um, and this is what the data show. So this is the data pooled over all subjects, and in, indeed there is this negative slope. Um, it can be statistically a bit dodgy to just pool all of your data from your subjects. So we just tested this on each subject. And uh, out of, I forget how many, so out of 12 subjects, I think 10 of them, or even 11, had a negative slope. And a handful of them, the, the effect was significant even within subject. But the overall p-value is, is, is quite, quite low, quite small. Um, so this, this prediction is borne born out by the, by the data. Um, any questions about that before I move on? So back to this question of when is the neuronal commitment to move relative to the onset of movement. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? I don't, I... Um, we started 20 past, so let's say another 15 minutes and then we should finish. finish. Okay, good. Um, so if we were to invent uh, a, movement, a, a movement experiment, an experiment where we wanted to study self-initiated movement. Um, what we do with a, with a typical experimental design is, is collect a set of epochs with a movement, a set of epochs without a movement, and compare them. Right? That's, that's the idea. Uh, but we never do that. We never have these epochs without a movement. Why? Because we use the movement itself to know which, where to time lock the data. If you don't make a movement, we don't know what, what epoch is that. There's no, right? So this is the actual state of events, state of affairs. And, and what we end up doing is saying, well, if I look really far back in time, like three seconds or two seconds back in time, I can use that as a baseline. But that's very, very problematic and very dodgy, if you ask me. Because the baseline has a fixed temporal relationship with the event that you're studying in the first place. So this is going to be a very... This sample, if you want to call it that, is going to be a very biased sample. Uh, and because, because we know for a fact that these time series are autocorrelated, it's almost guaranteed that there'll be a difference between this baseline and what happens out here. Um, so the moral of this is that sampling the conditions that are active when a movement is not about to happen is integral to being able to reliably predict and understand when movement is going to happen. But it's kind of like a game of, we uh, of weather predicting. Imagine that you wanted to try and learn how to predict the weather based on only a sample of rainy days. It won't work particularly well, right? It will, you'll have a hard time generalizing to, arbitrarily, ar to arbitrary weather conditions. Um, it will be hard 
to, to predict uh, when you come across a day where it doesn't rain. You haven't seen any of those in your data. Um, I don't know how that is here. Does it always rain here? Maybe you're stuck with that problem. Um, so uh, with that as our goal, uh, we, with, uh, together with Rob Shapiri and Mehmet Basbug at Princeton University, uh, we started this study to do some mapping because we wanted to map the time course of neural activity that's predictive of impending movement using a machine learning technique called AdaBoost, uh, which is a, an implementation of boosting. For those who are interested, I can, I can explain later how that works. Um, and we did this with combined EEG and MEG data that I collected at Neurospin in, in Paris. The paradigm we used briefly looks like this. Um, you watch a slideshow of uh, photographs of nature, pretty photographs without any real em emotional uh, content. Um, and before each photo is shown, you, you see a, a little instruction that says either manual or automatic. So if you see manual, it means it's up to you to press the button, or in this case, lift your finger. If somebody's just lifted their finger like this. Um, when you're done looking at the picture and you want to advance to the next one. So it's up to you. Um, on the automatic trials, you just left your hand laying there and just watched the picture, and after a while, it switched by itself. Um, and the viewing time on these automatic trials was drawn from the subject's own viewing time distribution on these trials. So for the first few trials of the experiment, it was just something around five seconds average. But as we started to acquire data from the subject, then the program that was running the experiment started using that as the distribution from which to draw the waiting times on these trials. So that at the end, at the end of the experiment, these, these two sets of trials are very well balanced right, in terms of how long you've been waiting. So they can account for things like anticipation, anticipation of the sensory consequences of your action, for example. So now we do have this, this scenario that we typically don't have, where we have movement plus slide, we, we time lock now everything, rather than time locking to the movement, we time lock to the slide transition. So here we have trials where the slide transition was provoked by a movement. Here we have trials where the slide transition uh, was, provoked, was triggered automatically by the computer, and there was no movement. Right? So these should be relatively well matched uh, in other respects. And then we collected these data, automatic these automatic exemplars and manual exemplars, and put them through this machine learning algorithm that tried to classify the difference between these two kinds, uh, these two patterns in the data, uh, for each position of a sliding window. So we had this window sliding across in time, and we wanted to look at what's the accuracy with which you can tell a movement epoch for, apart from a non-movement epoch at each point in time before the movement and slightly after. So here's a, this is a little uh, video uh, highlighting what, the, what this procedure looks like. So this white window here is the window that the classifier sees. So whatever's in gray out here, or whatever's in gray, period, classifier doesn't see that, right? It only sees what's in white, and we're aligning, we're aligning everything to the leading edge of the window. So we're not letting the classifier look in the future. It's only allowed to look in to the past, right? Um, and before I start the movie, so this is an ROC curve uh, plotting how well classifier is doing at that position of the window. And of course, for an, uh, so this being the false positive rate uh, along the bottom and the true positive rate here. So an, I, an ideal uh, detector will have this red curve pushed right up into the corner there, right? That's the best you can do. Um, and the, and if, it, if it's just right along the diagonal, then it's completely random. It's completely at chance. So uh, here's what this looks like. The window slides. What you see is that our ability to tell those apart, you can see here, this is, this is an example of a manual uh, trial. You can see that clearly the readiness potential here. And the green line is an example of an automatic trial. And you would expect our ability to tell them apart to build up just like this signal is building up. But it doesn't. Uh, if you watch it again, it doesn't build up in this area here. Only suddenly does it lurch up and become very significant at the very end, about 150, 200 milliseconds before. Um, you might naively expect 
So this is the average. We had, uh, we had a small number of subjects for this experiment. What we did was we had uh, these three subjects come back for repeated sessions so that we were collecting thousands of trials from each subject to give the uh, machine learning algorithm a good chance of working well. So you see that this, these, these traces don't deviate from chance until about 200 milliseconds before zero. So if you, if you looked at the readiness potential, you might expect this uh, time course to have this kind of gradual uh, ramping up shape like the readiness potential, which here is the readiness potential from the very same subjects going back. And notice the difference in the time scale. This is three seconds here. This is only one and a half seconds. So they clearly have a, a, a very long readiness potential extends way back into the past. But that doesn't show up here when we try to tell these two different kinds of uh, exemplars apart, these two different kinds of trials. So, so presumably the difference that the classifier was trying to learn about was the difference between the fact of having moved or not. And when you do that, you see that the information doesn't stretch back in time like the shape of the readiness potential would suggest. So just to, just to complete the thought, and the reason it doesn't step back in time is there were lots of little negative going to 